effects of molecules. DNA is planted onto a gold surface, conducting the flow of free electrons. This sentence here. The researchers then shone a laser onto the gold, which liberates electrons via the photoelectric effect. Some of these electrons travel through the DNA forest and are fed into a device that measures their spin polarization. Electron liberation, gold and twisted DNA forest. Count me in on that. But basically what they seem to be saying in a long article that I almost made you sit through is that everything inside and outside of us spins. Certain directions, always certain directions. And then we interact with other things, substances, DNA forests, and we are changed. But not inherently, maybe inherently, not genetically, but inherently we are affected by the DNA forests around us. The architecture of our daily movements. I like that. Spinning. The first timekeeping devices, clocks, were devised by monks to know when to call to prayer. Daniel J. Borston wrote about this in his book, The Discoverers. Only in modern times did we begin to live by the hour, much less the minute. The first steps towards mechanical measurement of time, the beginnings of the modern clock in Europe, came not from farmers or shepherds, nor from merchants or craftsmen, but from religious persons anxious to perform regularly their duty to God. Monks needed to know the time for their appointed prayers. In Europe, the first mechanical clocks were designed not to show time, but to sound it. The first Western clockworks, which set us on the way to clock making, were weight-driven machines which struck a bell after a measured interval. Two kinds of clocks were made for this purpose. Probably the earlier were smaller monastic alarms, or chamber clocks, called Orologia Excitatoria. These rang the small bell to alert a monk to summon the others to prayer. He would then go up to strike the large bell, usually set high in a tower, so that all could hear. About the same time, much larger turret clocks began to be made and placed in the towers, where they would ring the large bell automatically. Centuries before, complicated water clocks had been designed to mark passing time by tossing pebbles or blowing whistles. The sound of time rather than the look of it or the feel of it. Call to prayer seven times. This idea, or the fact that timekeeping devices were invented for prayer, is akin to the debate about clothing. Did we begin to wear clothes because we needed shelter? Or did we adorn ourselves to impress and compete for attention? What, if any, is the difference between the social need and the need? Are we not inherently, to our core, social needs? And if we are, does our definition of survival leave something to be desired. In the U.S. Army Survival Manual, they say that in any extreme situation, one cannot survive without A, three minutes of air, three hours without shelter, three days without water, and three weeks without food. But I have seen people unsurvive themselves without love, or really from the lack of ability to absorb love due to a need to put up mazes of walls caused, I think, by the need initially to survive. So it makes you wonder, or it makes me wonder, if our definition of survival, or our definition of necessity, and whether the phrase necessity is the mother of invention, while still true, is a bit more nuanced. I guess the crux is really the term necessary, and the necessary is really the mill where one must define that for themselves. Spinning. It is a fact that the tighter you spin into yourself, the stronger you are, the longer you will last, if you are a thread. A thread being a consolidated, discernible object twisted into itself composed of disparate pieces holding onto each other from the force of energy compaction. It is also a fact that the looser you are spun, the softer you are, the more vulnerable to abrasion. Pick your glory and your poison, we all wear away eventually. Though it is a common misunderstanding that what is natural will rot. What is natural will rot under particular conditions. The skin of the animal, peeled of its flesh, dries into the head of the drum. Its glues, serving as the most incredible shrinking tool. Sometimes I wonder, am I rotting away? What do I hold close and what am I peeling off? 
Is immortality just the lack of thought or dissolving? Perhaps it's both non-dissolving or complete dissolving. Sometimes the rotting away, the perfect amount of it, makes supple leather and an easy sloughing off of what is old. Sometimes we have to rot away a little bit to make the peeling easier. But finding the line and catching it as it drifts by in a time river, that's the key. Sinking into grief to digest it and come out the other end. Sometimes we don't come out. Sometimes last year's perfectly transformable, extractable stalks of fiber slowly slump into the underbrush and prairie of spring rains without being noticed or picked. Bacteria, fungi, microbes, cockroaches, the creatures that eat, those ones that clean up after all this refuse of growing and pulling apart. I've always loved the vulture, the vulture spins. She gets way up high and surveys the range. The North American vulture has no voice, she only hisses. The silent spinner, bald head to do the dirty work. I guess it's more about being equipped for your job than being all jobs. They don't tell you that really when you're becoming. Time. Time was shorter when we were closer to the moon. The waves were higher, the sea creatures bigger. We spun faster, saw more stars in the span of less days. If time is that relative, if time is contingent on our proximity to other, then speed is a figment, for proximity is bound to change. Spinning. Carry oneself. How do you carry yourself? How do you hold it together? Terms from dread seeping in. Inherent need to collect and hold incessant nets spinning. Who are the masters of spinning, nets said? Not the humans, nor the planets, but the spiders. Spider silk, thread. Silk from their feet, silk from their butts. Zigzag molecular configurations, elastic, sticky, sturdy, resilient. Used in rifles to steady the viewfinder. Strong enough to withstand the firing of a bullet. In 1823, John Leslie wrote in The Elements of Natural Philosophy that the silk line as spun by the worm is about the 5,000th part of an inch thick. But a spider's line is perhaps six times finer or only the 30,000th part of an inch in diameter insomuch that a single pound of this attenuated substance might be sufficient to encompass our globe. Scientists are working on armor made of spider silk, ten times stronger than Kevlar, from the bark spider. It's still a pipe dream, but so is going to the moon. I love you to the moon. Was that supposed to be a statement of an impossible amount of love? Now it's just average. Soon it will mean, I love you so much that I will destroy this earth loving you and escape to my moon colony. But maybe I love you to the moon now. Maybe it means I love you and I want to float through space and watch the stars and big moon. Imagine one thread of silk encompassing the globe. Imagine being wrapped in threads far thinner than the eye can see. We are wrapped in threads we cannot see. They are lightweight, but sometimes they feel heavy, heavy like the feel of armor. Armor. The earth has armor. A crust. A crust above the magma, above the beating heart. And the crust has armor. The crust has soil, and the soil has armor. The soil has roots. And here in these parts, the tall grass prairie holds that soil. Tall grass prairie plants believe to be native to North America. Native being that thing that is the farthest back thing we know, but not the ultimate thing. Because glaciers happen and erase what we know. Glaciers happen and erase what we know. Glaciers happen and erase what we know. Glaciers happen. And erase what we know. 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 Thank you.